I just want to welcome everyone. My name is Patty Taylor, and I am the administrative support for the Office of Health Promotion and Wellness that actually sponsors these webinars. And today's webinar topic is physical activity, getting your families to move more. And I did want to let you know that we will be recording this webinar. So um, if you wanna go back and check it out, you can do that later, or if anyone was not able to attend, they can definitely um, go in and, and um, listen to this recording. And I want to let you know that we are going to have another random drawing again, and this time it is for some t-shirts. Um, I do have a couple of child size t-shirts, and then also we have three Fitbit flexes that um, we will be giving away. So everyone who is in attendance will be entered in that drawing. So I want to introduce our two amazing presenters today. We have Dr. Karen Springer and Suzanne Walton. And Karen Springer is MD, practices family medicine at the Intermountain North Orm Clinic and teaches residents as part-time faculty at the Utah Valley Family Medicine Residency. She is passionate about optimizing health through preventive and lifestyle medicine and is the medical director for Intermountain's Utah Valley Live Well Center in Provo, Utah. After graduating from Stanford University with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Bachelor of, of Arts in Psychology, Dr. Springer received her Doctor of Medicine from the University of Utah School of Medicine then completed her residency in family medicine at the Utah Valley Family Medicine Residency in Provo, Utah. Dr. Springer also serves as chair of the Intermountain Medical Group Board and is currently a member of the Intermountain Board of Trustees. And Suzanne, our other, Suzanne Walton, our other presenter, is a graduate of Brigham Young University, Idaho with a Bachelor of Science degree in exercise physiology. Prior to assuming the manager role of the Livewell Center in Provo, Suzanne was an exercise therapist and a clinical supervisor at the Utah Valley Livewell Center. She also has experience teaching group fitness classes and assisting patients in physical therapy. So we would like to go ahead and um, have them start. We're, I'm just thrilled to have them presenting on this subject. Thank you so much, Patty. Uh, we are very excited to be here and uh, thank you all for attending tonight. Um, we hope that this will be informative for you and also fun uh, that we can learn some things together. And so um, as um, the official title is what you heard was, you know, physical activity, getting your families to move more. But as Suzanne and I were really talking about it, we really want to show you that exercise is fun, really. So that's why we changed the topic and hopefully that this will be something for you, your families, um, kids or whoever that you come in contact with or your close people um, to really help get them moving more. So with that, you know, a lot of times we think um, as we are doing things, um, we often feel like anything that's good uh, or anything that we know we should do, it's always like this tug of war, right? You know, we as the adults are pulling one direction. We want our kids to go to bed earlier. We want our families to eat healthier. We want them to be more active. We want them to uh, do their homework. And then on the flip side, um, we have the kids, right? And they're pulling just as hard um, a lot of the times in their direction because they want to do what they want to do. And that makes sense because I think that is the case for all of us is that we always want to do what we want to do. So a lot of times when we talk about healthy things, we get in this tug of war. And so I hope today that we will be able to um, give some ideas to get from this type of tug of war type thing to where everyone um, in your family is celebrating um, all the good choices. So before we get started in some of the um, basics of what physical activity and some of the science behind that and recommendations, I think it's really important to start off with um, a question. And that is what motivates your family? And as I was thinking about this, you know, it's every family is different. Every person is different. And I have to say, I'm not sure that I have really ever asked myself that question in terms of my family. 
we also we often think about you know what we want to do and some ways to uh, get those things done. But really sitting down and going, okay, what motivates my kids? What motivates my family? What motivates me? And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the motivation science and, um, and how that relates to behaviors. So what's the most common way we motivate in, in, as parents? Carrot and stick, right? I know that everyone, um, well, I can't say everyone, but I know I certainly have done the carrot and stick approach many times as a parent. I have four kids. And um, most of them are kind of older now, but certainly through the years, I have definitely used uh, probably more stick than carrot, unfortunately. But, but the carrot, of course, is all the rewards, um, the earning different things, uh, behavior charts, that kind of stuff. And the stick, of course, are the rules, the consequences, and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with this necessarily. Um, and it usually is successful in the beginning but it is very difficult to sustain and often stops working and sometimes can even backfire in terms of helping motivate uh, that behavior change. Um, and I know uh, I have over the years had multiple programs of, you know, earning coins, earning stars, or doing other things to try to get that carrot type thing. And honestly, they usually last about two to three months. And in fact, I think I had one kid said, so is this our new program this time? Um, just knowing that eventually it would be something that would uh, change later on. So why is that? Why is Why does the carrot and stick not really work long term? And I think that comes down to understanding what motivation um, is. You have two basic categories of motivation. The first is extrinsic. So that really at the base level is just doing something, so some activity for a separable outcome. So not because of the activity, but because you're going to get something separate from the activity. And then you have intrinsic, which is doing something just for the inherent enjoyment of that activity. And when you look at the science behind it, typically an extrinsic um, motivation is usually less sustainable. And intrinsic typically leads to more engagement long term and ends up with better results. So the carrot and stick really falls under the extrinsic motivator. And it's not all bad. And often we need to start that, especially with a child or someone who is not motivated, um, could even be ourselves, right? Creating those reward systems. But if we're not motivated intrinsically enough, then yeah, it is fine to start off with the extrinsic type motivators. But um, in order to get the behavior to continue, um, you really need to probably switch to that intrinsic motivation. And the hard part about extrinsic as well is that it can actually lead to demotivation. So if there was any sort of intrinsic motivation to begin with, as you put that carrot or stick behind it, um, a lot of times that reward or that controlling factor of the consequences will actually eventually lead to someone being less motivated to do that activity because it never really leads to that enjoyment of that particular activity. So when we're talking about this, how can we motivate differently? And it's kind of like this switch right here is that it you it's easier said than done, certainly, but we can change. And just like we um, need to, to uh, help our families and our um, our kids to make those changes, you know, this is something that will take some practice from us. So some thoughts around that of how we might motivate differently, trying to find um, and be inspiring instead of controlling. So rather than setting those consequences, try to really inspire and help them internalize why it is so important to do this. So that way they can have that, um, start to that have that understanding on their own of, yeah, I understand that this is probably good for me. Um, now, of course, not every kid's gonna be at that level, but certainly um, you can do it age appropriate for this. Um, really important too is the concept of appropriate autonomy. Now, um, you know, uh, one of the best examples I use is like, you know, at a dinner time, you know, a lot of times we we'll say, nope, you have to eat your broccoli or whatever. Um, but instead, you know, if you have two vegetables or something, OK, do you want broccoli tonight or do you want, you know, corn and, you know, giving that appropriate autonomy and that allows them to actually practice decision making, which is super important in terms of future development of intrinsic motivation and that those opportunities to practice decision making then get helps them be confident in that. And then they hopefully can then continue to do um, more and more decision-making um, on that good path and develop the, that intrinsic motivation. 
finding optimal challenges really comes to the thought of we want to say take where um, we are and then create that challenge just slightly above or you know a little bit above where we are so it's not super easy but it's also not so um, impossible or seemingly um, unreachable so that's that concept of finding that optimal challenge and that really will help develop that sense of accomplishment and competence um, so um, just slightly difficult but not um, not unreachable um, Authoritative parenting is really key and authoritative parenting has been shown in studies to be actually one of the more effective ways to parent um, in short demand. It's um, in short uh, definition. It really is just the concept of high touch and high standards. So highly responsive um, to kids, but yet setting um, boundaries and standards and demands that are also um, of high expectation. And as you have activities, um, that you want your children to do or your families to do, um, fostering that relatedness so they're connecting with you. And um, of course, it involves the, the last thing, which is yourself getting involved in those things, and they see you doing it. And because of that high touch and high expectations, then that can help develop intrinsic motivation. So those are just some kind of quick um, science type based things on um, how we might motivate people um, and that science of motivation and behavior change. So with that, I'm going to switch over a little bit to moving more and let's talk about what really uh, are, is recommended for physical activity um, and our family. So I hope some of you have done Slido before. Um, and so what this is, is if you have your phone, just take a quick picture of the QR code here. Or if you um, are on a computer or don't have a phone that does QR codes, just type in slido.com and then you can just put in this number. And so this is our very first poll. We have three of them. So hopefully um, I will give you a little bit longer on this side to uh, join um, us on Slido, but I do hope that you all will take a minute to join us. So our first poll is how many minutes of physical activity are recommended per day for kids ages six to 17? So 15 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, one hour, or two hours. All right, so I have two people answering. So I think there are probably about 20 or plus people on the line. So we'll let, wait till we at least get maybe 10, 10 of us on here and see where we're at. We'll give it another 15 seconds or so. Awesome. Well, um, you guys are correct overall. So 42% of you said one hour, and that is actually the correct amount for ages six to 17. Um, and so with that, let me just get back to here for a second. So with that, um, I, I, because we're also, it's important for adults too, I thought I would include the adults um, recommendations. So some of you may have been getting the 30 minutes from the adults, and that is the minimum for adults, 30 minutes, so 150 minutes per week, um, or, or ideally 300 minutes, so that's one hour, five days per week, if you're doing moderate. And so moderate activity is going to be of the, like you're walking fast enough or doing the activity fast enough that you can still have a conversation, but it's not uh, easy to have a conversation. Versus vigorous is probably you're only able to speak in a few sentences or things like that. Um, the second recommendation for adults really comes around a, a resistance training. So, or I like to call it more muscle strengthening. So that should be about two to three times per week and something that's more focused on um, actually developing muscles. So Pilates, power yoga, body weight, going to the gym, any of those types of things. Uh, with regards to um, the kids, so 6 to 17, we recommend at least 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous activity, and then ages 3 to 5 just throughout the day. And these are the, um, uh, it's interesting, so if you maintain physical activity from adolescence into later adulthood, um, you have approximately 29 to 36% lower risk of all-cause mortality, so mortality, any cause of death. Um, so that's really important to get our kids started early um, in order to help get in that benefit. One of the problems, of course, um, this is talking about exercise, so that type of physical activity. 
But one of the other problems is that we sit too much. And um, the average sitting per day, um, I put this range eight to 12 hours. Um, eight to 12 hours is for adults. Um, and they estimate though still, kids sit about an average of eight hours per day. And the problem is, is the higher, um, the more you sit per day, the higher risk that you have of heart disease and diabetes. And that risk goes up if you have no physical activity. So no exercise on top of that. So with that, you know, just doing simple things just to get you moving. So we have physical activity, which is the exercise piece, and then the physical activity in terms of being more active. And that's where you can stand while doing activities. I know I'd love to have my stand up desk and you can do all sorts of things standing on one leg doing calf raises those types of things when you're in meetings or cooking or you know doing any activity where you um, could be sitting or standing you know walking or riding uh, to school uh, with your kids uh, you know getting up and talking i don't know if any of you have teenagers but a lot of times i'll see teenage friends come over and they're in the same room or close by and they're texting each other instead of talking to them um, but doing things like that and setting a timer or just making sure you get up. So here is our next um, uh, Slido. So this is, again, just join in like we did before. And hopefully you should automatically, if you still have that on your screen, it will just automatically switch to this um, new question. But what is the guidance around recreational screen time for school age kids and teens? So we have no more than two hours per day, only 30 minutes per day no more than one hour per day or none during the school week. And what I mean by recreational is not doing, um, not their homework and things like that. So screen time on their phones or video games or that type of thing. All right, so we'll wait the same thing till we get about 10 to 12 people. Wow, we're split. We need one more person to vote to kind of help us go right to, to, to actually make a winner here. Is there one more person? Okay, well, an even split. Um, the right answer actually is no more than two hours per day um, is what is the current recommendation. And of course, less is always fine, but in terms of the actual recommendation, it is um, that amount. So. So with that, oh, there we go. See, now someone voted on the number. Thank you, whoever made sure that we got the right answer um, top. So with that, let's share some stats on screen time. So the average screen time, now knowing what the recommended is, uh, uh, for ages 8 to 12, 4 to 6 hours per day. For teens, and any of you who have teens know this, um, they can spend on average up to 9 hours per day. Uh, when we even have to consider young kids who are spending, but the recommended is no more than one hour per day. So, uh, and hopefully more educational type programs on TV and things like that. And then like we already talked about, um, no more than two hours for um, teens or eight to 18 on the screen. Now, this is challenging, of course. Um, and so this is where I think it's really important to kind of get that understanding of why this is important. And this is not only contributing to obviously sitting more, which we've already talked about the issues, but screen time specifically can lead to more sleep problems, lower grades, you know, not as good reading level. Um, obviously, they're not as social because they're not spending as much time with family and friends. Um, and then a lot of health, physical health issues, weight problems, mood problems, poor self-image and body, um, body, issue, body image issues. So there are a lot of health reasons to try to be diligent about decreasing screen time. So with that, some ideas to hopefully make this happen. Um, and um, because we talked earlier about motivation and that people are all on the spectrum. So I'm gonna give some intrinsic and some extrinsic ways that we can certainly try to help do, make this happen. So the first, let's talk about why it's important. Like we just talked about, give the reasons why it can affect them. Um, you know, really prioritize that unplugged time, find fun things to do and really look for ways that um, you can have opportunities to have that more face to face interaction. So, you know, play dates or activities or sports or, you know, going to the park or all those types of things that are really good to help prioritize that unplugged playtime. You know, uh, there are a couple of things, you know, finding um, media free times or media free zones. So, for example, I don't let my kids have uh, their phones down in their bedrooms um, just as a barrier so that if they are, they're upstairs with where we're at. So that way we can um, help monitor that a little bit or like dinner time, making sure that phones are away for that. 
you know, kind of um, using, there are a lot of different apps that can help set limits and really, um, so you, they have to request or the Wi-Fi shuts off so they can't still be on their screen for all the things they like to do. Here's an extrinsic way to do it, right? Which is have them earn the screen time by doing some other sort of um, behavior or activity that you want them to do, and then they can earn the screen time. And then these last two really come down to you um, because you know I don't know how many times we've been in restaurants or at dinner tables and um, we see that uh, you have the whole people, like the, all, all of them are there and they're almost all on their phones. And so not being fully present and of course not setting the example. So with that, um, I'm gonna switch to kind of a little bit some ideas to help uh, make us move more. And making it fun um, is certainly the number one way, right? If we can find some way to make it fun um, and do what it is, um, that's great. Or do it with someone in the group, um, make that social connection and that makes it more fun. Um, you know, as, a, as an adult, I know that I have TV shows on Netflix that I only watch when I'm exercising. So if I want to finish off that episode, I have to exercise a little bit more. So you can create some of those types of things to make it fun. Celebrating success um, by just um, making sure that they feel that inherent enjoyment of, hey, yes, I accomplished this by being active. And then little things, parking farther, taking the stairs or other things like that. You know, there's a lot of technology that can help. And Suzanne will go into some of the resources after um, I'm finished here. Um, but seven minute app, there's workout apps, there's yoga apps, all sorts of things that you can do to kind of make things a little bit different. Um, and then doing it together and being examples. So this is a picture of my son from a couple years ago. And I started doing sprint triathlons a few years back. And uh, there was a Murray City always puts on a family triathlon. And it's a sprint, um, but it's a mini sprint. So it's half the distances. So a one and a half mile run, you know, 150 meter swim and like a six mile bike. And so my son, um, I asked him if he wanted to do it. Now he's very active. He does uh, soccer, he does basketball, but he doesn't really like to bike. Uh, he doesn't really swim. Um, and uh, he only runs when he has to in basketball and soccer. And so I, he said, no, nah, mom, I don't really want to do that. And, I, and he said, but are you still going to do it if, if I don't do it? And I said, no, I'm not going to do that because it's a, really meant to be a family triathlon. And he's like, okay, well, I guess I'll do it. And so just the example of um, my doing the sprint triathlons got him to do it. And um, the, the greatest thing, he's smiling here because uh, that's his time, which is 20 seconds faster than me. I did wait for him quite a bit for the transitions, but the very end, he just sprinted to the end. Um, so that way he could say that he beat me. Um, and so making that type of fun example and doing it together is really a great way to get us to move more regularly. So with that, I'm gonna turn some time over to Suzanne, because she's come up some also some creative ideas about how we might um, get us to move more. So Suzanne, I'll turn the time over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Springer. And just as Dr. Springer has talked about, we wanna find activities that are gonna be enjoyable for your children um, and also activities that you guys can do together as a family, because by doing things together, um, generally you're more likely to do them. So uh, we put together some activities based on the season. As you know, generally fruits and vegetables are better when eaten in season. And so we, we tried to look for activities that would be fun to do depending upon the weather um, outside. So you can look over these pictures. Another thing we wanted to focus on is activities that are free or that are low cost because to move and to exercise, um, hopefully you can do that doing, I guess, for free. <laughs> but you don't have to don't have to pay for um, the ability to move. And so thinking about your yard, being able to go out and garden with your family, um, it's known that kids will, um, will generally eat the foods better if they take part in planting them and learning how to grow vegetables. And so putting together a garden, um, finding activities in the water, whether it's paddle boarding or canoeing or swimming with your kids um, after dinner, I know for my family, we used to go on walks every night after dinner. And it was nice because the weather cooled down and we could take a walk around the neighborhood and move. Um, other things you can do is go camping, uh, jumping on the trampoline, finding ways to uh, make going to the park creative. My parents were so good at we'd go to the park and they would create these obstacle courses for us. And it'd be a challenge and we'd compete against our siblings. And so just fun, um, easy things that can be enjoyable. So those are spring and summer. And then next is fall and winter. 
uh, fall and winter can generally be a little bit harder to be motivated to get outside and exercise because it's cold. And one thing that I found is that a lot of the activities you can do in the spring and the summer, you can also do in the fall and winter if you just have the right clothing. So getting out on hikes, um, going to a trampoline park where it's indoors instead of outside in your backyard. You can create obstacle courses as well throughout your home, putting together challenges for your kids to do, um, finding indoor swimming pools. And then obviously there are so many fun things to do with colder weather, um, being able to ice skate or sled, um, go snow skiing, building a snowman with your family or having a snowball fight can be really fun. Um, and even with the fall coming up, being able to rake leaves into a big pile and jump in them and, and play in the leaves. So lots of fun, um, easy ideas to help your families move. And just here as we end, I will share a couple of resources that you can look up. Kids Cosmic Yoga is really fun. It's geared towards younger children, but there's an interactive yoga instructor. Um, you can find it on YouTube. Just Google Kids Cosmic Yoga. And there's a variety of yoga classes that you can do. And she takes kids into these fun places underwater and out in space. And there's fun graphics and things to keep kids moving. Um, Nike training app, they have an option where it's a dad and his daughter that create these exercise programs together, which is really fun. There's also um, just your local rec centers. So um, Provo, Orem, American Fork, I know they all have rec centers available that you can go to that have various classes. Um, and then there's also youth programs. So lots of the rec centers will put together sports teams or um, sports leagues that you can sign your kids up for that are fun and interactive. And then here at the Livewell Center, we offer family fitness classes for kids. So it's a half hour class that's interactive. Um, right now it's just virtual, but it's a fun way to keep your kids moving and you can do it from your own home if you're worried um, about safety and, and getting out. So a few resources there. Um, and I think we'll just end if anyone has, oh, Yes, one last thing. We wanted to hear from you. What um, is your favorite way to be active with your family? So once again, um, get your phones out or go to slido.com and it's just a fill in response. So once again, 10 to 12 people, if you just want to share some of your favorite ideas to be active with your family so we can can learn from you. And while we're doing that, Patty, if there are any questions on the teams, we're happy to take those too while people are um, writing those in. Thank you. Yeah, just put your questions in the chat and I will share those with uh, Dr. Springer and Suzanne. I love these. It looks like there's a few people who have said hiking. Um, usually the words get bigger as more people respond with the same response, but walking your dog is a great one. Um, camping, riding your bike, paddle boarding, hiking. Is that one hiding? I like that one, like hide and seek. That's a great one to be oh. active if that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dancing, dancing is so fun throw on some music and dance in the kitchen while you're doing dishes or getting meals ready is always fun. Well, awesome. You guys can um, certainly keep filling in those um, and then um, Patty will turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Springer and Suzanne. Such useful and I think fun information you've shared. Um, so we do have maybe about a minute if anyone would like to put any questions in the chat. I do like the comment from Julie. She did say, I have heard the coach slash chair is the enemy. Um, we do, and Julie did put a question in the chat. She said, was the Cosmic Kids Yoga YouTube? Yes. Yep, you can just search it on YouTube and you'll find a lot of different um, options there. Oh, and my apologies. She just corrected. She said, I have heard the couch chair is the enemy. <laughs> that makes more sense. 
Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, but in that case, if that's where you are at, there is a you know couch to 5k app <laughs> that can help you get moving as well. So <laughs> and feel free if you just want to unmute too, you're welcome to ask any questions. But um, I think we're about at time, right, Patty? Yes, but I'm happy, we we're are. happy to do another we question are. with you. But thank you. Any Yes, yes, we are at time. And once again, thank you so much. Just such an enjoyable presentation and great information. So just a reminder, we do have our next uh, Live Well webinar on Wednesday, October 6th. And we will be having Kami Flygare present on activity snacks, 10 minutes to satisfy your movement craving. So thanks again all for joining and just a reminder, you can go to the Healthy at Home website and access all of these Live Well webinar webinars. They are recorded. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your time. Have a great night. Thank you.